Now I have the um, great pleasure of introducing Audrey Kobayashi, someone that you all know. Uh, Audrey is the current president of the association and uh, she's been absolutely wonderful to work with. Uh, she's made so much progress for our, our discipline and continues to, uh, to forge, uh, to, to, to lead us forward in so many ways. Uh, she's also organized this um, tremendous opening session on a very important topic. So, if, Audrey, if you would, please. Thank you, Doug. Good evening, everyone. It's just great to see this wonderful turnout. Um, and Well, this is my dream panel, so I want to start by thanking all of them for being here. One of, the, one of the privileges of the president is to put together a dream panel, and this is it. Uh, I want to welcome all of you uh, very warmly to the 108th annual meeting of the AAG. And this is the largest AAG uh, annual meeting, and therefore, I believe, the largest international gathering of geographers ever in one city. So how scary is that? <laughs> so thank you all for coming um, and for attending this session tonight. We're going to hear from five individuals who represent the very best scholarship and social action devoted to social justice and, and human rights. Um, geographers are part of a discipline in which contributing to the betterment of humanity um, is a very large part of our scholarship. Nearly four decades ago when David Harvey wrote Social Justice in the City, the discipline was a turning point, and I know there are many in this room who will remember those times. Um, and although I cannot say that issues around achieving justice, including violence, racism, poverty, um, have gone away, I can say with a lot of confidence um, and some pride that geographers have made a difference in addressing those uh, issues, made important contributions, uh, and uh, several of them are with us tonight. Uh, but tonight's session was motivated by a need to look at, at society today, at the changes and challenges occurring within a context that you all know well of economic restructuring, shifting regimes of governance, uh, revision of, of the roles and responsibilities in civil society, and also shifting patterns of disenfranchisement for marginalized groups that include the growing ranks of the poor in this country and elsewhere, sexual minorities, people of color, and recent and undocumented immigrants. So the, the title of this session, which is a kind of broad title that I hope fits, uh, The City Beyond Symbolism, was inspired by a piece uh, by Princeton University's Cornell West, who along with uh, talk show host Tavis Smiley, recently conducted a national tour uh, entitled The Tour Against Poverty, and he broadcast uh, interviews from across the country. One of those interviews was, in fact, with Grace Lee Boggs, who clearly inspired him to write the following, and I'm going to quote um, just briefly um, from Cornell West. King weeps in his grave. He never confused substance with symbolism. He never conflated flesh and blood sacrifice with a stone and mortar edifice. We rightly celebrate his substance and sacrifice because he loved us all so deeply. Let us not remain satisfied with symbolism because too often we fear the challenge that he embraced. So the five individuals speaking tonight have also never confused substance with symbolism. They're all academics who have made social justice uh, from the grassroots, the center of their careers, and who have in various ways showed courage and leadership in the face of political opposition, and I think I can say have shown that they love us deeply. Our first speaker is Francis Fox Piven, distinguished professor of the City of University New York Graduate Center. Professor Piven is an original thinker and a tireless activist who is well known uh, for maintaining the courage of her convictions in addressing social issues. She is uh, past president of the American Sociological Association uh, and past president of the Society for the Study of Social Problems and past vice president of the American Political Science Association. She is a recipient of many awards, and I'm not going to list too many because uh, I know you want to hear from her, um, but including the President's Award of the American Public Health Association 
and the American Sociological Association Career Award for the Practice of Sociology. She is also the author of many books, and I am not going to list all of those. The first was Regulating the Poor, which won the C. Wright Mills Award. Uh, Poor People's Movements, uh, which is the, one of the first things that I give all my graduate students to read. Um, the New Class War, Why Americans Don't Vote, Why Americans Still Don't Vote. Um, the War at Home, and most recently, Challenging Authority, How Ordinary People Change uh, America. Uh, I am absolutely delighted and honored to introduce tonight Francis Fox Piven. Thank you, Audrey, and I'm delighted to be a geographer for the night. Or who knows, maybe I really am a geographer. It's hard to tell sometimes. Uh, this is my town, New York City. Uh, I grew up here, and I want to welcome you to New York. But I have some bad things to say about my city. Uh, I have to welcome you to a city that is the capital, the center of financial capitalism, a financial capitalism that is running the world ragged. Uh, I'm welcome, welcoming you to a city where predatory real estate has been out of control for decades, destroying working class neighborhoods that I knew when I was growing up and destroying the warrens of little commercial enterprises where I prowled and explored as a child. Instead, we have these gleaming glass towers and the people and the little businesses are gone. Uh, I have to welcome you also to a city that exemplifies the extreme inequality that has been the product of a financial capitalism out of control. Uh, the head of uh, the, Jamie Parrott said not, recently, uh, not long ago, pointed out that if New York City were a country and it was ranked among the countries in terms of its degree of income concentration, New York City would be 14th among 134 countries. So welcome. Also, you know, the poorest urban county in the country, the Bronx, is only 15 miles from Wall Street. So, welcome to a city that exemplifies the moral issues and the intellectual and practical problems associated with the extremes of social injustice that have been created by financial capitalism out of control. It's a good place to have this conference. Not only that, I think you came at the right time. Suddenly, it's not so gloomy. Suddenly, there seems to be the possibility that the forces of the capitalist system can maybe halted and even turned aside or turned back. You know, in American history, the great moments of humanizing and democratic reform have always come from the bottom, from the rise of insurgent protest movements, even the establishment of a republic, a democratic, re well, not such a perfect democratic republic, but a republic at least with some of the elements of electoral representative democracy even that was the result of a kind of insurgency of artisans and dirt farmers in the revolutionary era. And these ordinary people were empowered at the time because colonial elites needed them in their war with England. 
That was in a way an elite war, but it was a war into which ordinary people were able to enter because you couldn't make a war without ordinary people to carry the muskets and shed the blood and provide the wealth with which the war was fought. Or think about the great struggle which dominated the 19th century for the emancipation of the slaves who had brought here, who had been brought here by uh, merchant capitalists. Well, that movement, which began in the 1830s and was responsible for the Civil War, it resulted in at least a formal emancipation of the freedmen. Or think about the populist movement of the late 19th century, early 20th century, a movement of ordinary farmers who were being squeezed by the railroads. Each of these movements won something, formal emancipation of the slaves. The populist movement didn't win, but it gave rise to the progressive era legislation. The labor movement forced government to put governmental authority behind the right to unionize, and some rights at least to strike. Or the civil rights movement, which finally forced the realization of the hopes of the abolitionists. Those were protest movements of incredible sweep and scope and daring and courage. Well, I think we're on the cusp of another such movement. And we desperately need it because after nearly half a century now of the domination of financial capitalism, our country has really all of our achievements, some of which took decades, even centuries, they have been twisted and turned aside. We need a, another protest movement to recover what we have lost and to try to move forward. Now, why do I say maybe there, we're on the cusp of another social movement? I mean Occupy, of course. I assume, don't geographers love Occupy? I mean, when has there been a movement that sort of asserted the geographer's credo that space, occupying space, can be a lever for social transformation? Hug Occupy, take it to your bosom. It is your movement, it really is. So, well, movements do two things two kinds of achievements. Movements communicate in a way that penetrates, rides right over the diverse kinds of propaganda that are produced by money and the control of the media and control of the political parties. But movements with their drama, their exhortations, their flags, their songs, movements can really dispel the fog of propaganda, at least for a while. So that's one thing that movements do. The other thing that movements do is that movements cause trouble. Movements cause, movements are constituted in a way by the withdrawal by ordinary people of their cooperation. No, we're not gonna go to work. We're on strike, in fact. We're not gonna go to school. We're gonna block the highways. We're not taking our milk to market. And those acts of defiance cause institutional disruption. That contributes to the extraordinary communicative power of movements, but it does more than that. It exerts real pressure on the authorities in these institutions for the restoration of normalcy by making concessions to the movement. So in the absence of these kinds of movements, and we're very fortunate that we have had successive periods of movements, in the absence of the movement, American politics and the American economy and American society returns to its default position, 
which is a position of money domination. Of course, how could votes overpower the money that drowns the electoral system? So, so far, Occupy has succeeded in the first stage of the movement. Their rhetoric has been brilliant. We are the 99%. We're occupying Wall Street. Of course, they were four blocks north. They were not on Wall Street. But they were occupying. They weren't demonstrating. That meant they weren't going to go home at sundown. And the idea had so much traction. It spread around the globe. And it was, it was what they call a spark. Whenever social scientists don't understand something, they use the metaphors of spark or match or whatever. It was the spark. And it was amazing. And it was so amazing that after a couple of months, the mayors decided they had to clear out these encampments because they were rhetorically so persuasive. Half of Americans were saying they agreed with Occupy. Well, so that was an accomplishment. You could see Obama responding to it in his proposals that came after Occupy. A little bit more populist, a little bit more concerned about jobs, a little bit more intent on redistribution. But now we have to, by forcing Occupy out of the parks, the mayors, I think, made a big mistake. They forced Occupy to move, maybe a little bit quicker than they would otherwise have moved, to the second stage of the movement, the disruptive stage of the movement. And that's where we are now. Occupy has moved out into the neighborhoods where it's helping people to resist house foreclosures. Occupy has moved into labor actions with the longshoremen, the communication workers of America, for example. Occupy, today I heard, Occupy the Securities Exchange Commission. I have to say I don't know what that is because I haven't been home, but Occupy has moved into the challenging and disruptive phase of a social movement. There will be setbacks. Movements don't occur in one grand Fourth of July explosion. They're very uneven, interrupted. They're set back. They occur again. But I think we can look forward to a period of maybe eight or 10 years of resistance and protest in the effort to hold back the forces of financial capitalism that is destroying my city for the people who lived in it, and an effort to give us to transformative examples of how we can organize society. Uh, I thank you. Am I? What? I'm under my time. OK. <laughs> I was so sure I was over my time. Thank you for listening to me. Uh, our next speaker is not in the room. However, she will be in a moment. Grace Lee Boggs is a much honored philosopher and public intellectual whose major writings include Revolution and Evolution in the 20th Century, written with James Boggs, Conversations in Maine, Exploring Our Nation's Future, uh, with a number of uh, co-authors, Living for Change, an autobiography, and recently, The Next American Revolution, Sustainable Activism in the 20th Century, with Scott Kurashige. At 97 years old, uh, Grace remains very much in demand uh, as a public speaker, an exceptional community activist, a very active community activist, and a weekly columnist for the Michigan Citizen. I um, was very interested to read Danny Glover's uh, introduction to um, her recent book, in which he says of Grace that uh, 
her approach is not just sitting around in some isolated place talking about what we should be doing, but doing it herself. And I think that uh, captivates in a few words, uh, if anything can, the life of Grace Lee Boggs, who is one of the most amazing women uh, in the United States today. Here's Grace. You have an audience here of Occupy Wall Street. What do you want to say to them? I want to say thank you for breaking through the silence. Thank you for starting a movement. But you have a long way to go. This enemy of ours is not just Wall Street. It's a whole culture. It's a way of looking at us and valuing ourselves and each other. And how you are going to move beyond challenging Wall Street, how you're going to move to become part of the solution, is not going to be easy. You're have, going to have to do a lot of thinking. You have to look at how you yourselves have become part of this culture. You have, look, have to look at how many of you would be happy if you could become part of Wall Street and become part of the corporations if they would give you jobs. There's a long road ahead because you have the opportunity to create something new that's based on completely different values, but you're going to have to be thinking about values and not just about abuses. You begin with the demonstration. You begin with the protests, but you have to move on from there. And it's, that's what I see happening now with Occupy Wall Street, that people are righteously, rightfully protesting the corporations and the domination of the culture by the corporations and the suffering that that is inducing. But out of the protests, they have to move to another stage. They have to begin doing something that doesn't depend on, uh, on exposing the enemy. That you have to begin becoming the solution yourself rather than protesting and challenging the enemy. We need people to be reinventing the institutions of our society, reinventing work so that we don't think that having a job and being able to pay the bills is what being a human being is all about. Reinventing education so that our young people are able to see themselves as part of the building and the rebuilding of our country. So many institutions of our society need reinventing, need rethinking. And you need to do that. You not, you not be satisfied with rebelling. You have to understand we're at one of those point, turning points in history where we need revolution. And revolution means reinventing culture. Scott Kurishige is an urbanist and historian, currently the director of Asian Pacific Islander American Studies at the University of Michigan. He is also an activist who has worked with Grace Lee Boggs for many years, and he is a board member of the James and Grace Lee Boggs Center to Nurture Community Leadership, which is based in Detroit.
His book, Shifting Grounds of Race, Black and Japanese Americans in the Making of Multi-Ethnic Los Angeles, received the American Historical Association's 2008 Albert J. Beveridge Award for, this is a little long, the best book in English on the history of the United States, Latin America, or Canada from 1492 to the present. <laughs> he, is, uh, he is also um, the co-author with, with Grace of The Next American Revolution, Sustainable Activism for the 21st Century. Well, thank you, Audrey, and thank you to the association. Uh, I am not a geographer, um, but I've learned so much from geographers over the years that I'm very honored to be here with you at your gathering. Um, and I bring uh, warm greetings from Grace Lee Boggs, who would love to be here if she could um, at the age, she's actually 96 still, she won't be 97 until June, um, but it's become much harder for her to travel, and she already had another trip scheduled to the West Coast um, next week at UC Berkeley, one of the events she'll be doing on a mini trip we're doing, uh, on March 2nd, she'll be doing a conversation with Angela Davis uh, on revolution. Um, and that will actually be streamed and it'll be online, um, so you'll have a chance to see that uh, if you're interested. Um, I am also not uh, a New Yorker, um, so I'm very happy to be here uh, with you. Um, but I'm gonna talk about my adopted hometown, Detroit, and how the sentiments that Grace Lee Boggs expressed in that video uh, that we just saw really emanate from her many, many years, over half a century now of living in Detroit and really feeling uh, the pulse of the city. And I'm gonna talk about particularly how Grace and her uh, late husband James Boggs developed the concept of moving from rebellion to revolution. Detroit is known in political history for two, two major events, particularly in social movement history. Uh, for the rise of organized labor and industrial unionism during the 1930s, um, and for uh, the 1967 urban rebellion, um, and more broadly, the Black Power Movement. And in some versions of history, in fact, in many versions of, of dominant discourse history, these are seen as high points and low points, the rise and fall of the city. And I'm going to challenge that narrative in a short period of time. I'm going to paint with a very broad brush. Um, but I'm going to talk about this concept of moving beyond rebellion um, and defining revolution and social transformation for our times. Rebellion, as Grace said, is an important stage in social transformation, breaking the threads that are holding the old order together, but then challenging us to move towards the next stage. Okay, so I'm gonna base what I'm uh, talking about today on a book I co-authored with Grace called The Next American Revolution. Just very quickly for those of you uh, who don't know more about her, as I mentioned, she's going to be 97 in June. She got a PhD in philosophy in 1940, and since that time, her entire adult life, she's been a community organizer, philosopher, and revolutionary activist. Chinese American, uh, born in this country, uh, but really has become an insider within the black community throughout her life. Best known in her early years for working very closely with CLR James, developing concepts of Marxist humanism, being involved and tied to pan-Africanism and the uh, decolonization movements. And then uh, in her middle years, uh, working very closely with James Boggs, an African-American auto worker and organic intellectual uh, in Detroit. They were deeply uh, at the heart of the civil rights of black power movements in Detroit. And, and since her husband's uh, passing in the 1990s, Grace has really been tied to the idea of Detroit as a city of hope, or as she sometimes calls it, uh, the aspiration to be a chapas of the North. Um, and if she were here today, she would want us to start with the question, what time is it on the clock of the world? And I see that we're in the middle of three really key historic trends. First, the U.S. is becoming majority people of color society. Detroit became majority black, majority people of color a long time ago. We're in the middle of the decline of American global hegemony. And of course, uh, we're living through the decline or already the collapse of industry in some cases and more generally an economic crisis. And these three phenomena are very, very evident in Detroit. And so I'm sure everyone has some image of Detroit that comes to mind. It may come from actually being in the city. It may come from just hearing urban legends of the, of the city. Um, but everyone in this country has some image of Detroit. And mostly outsiders would think about what's missing from Detroit. So what's missing today, 
our jobs, the real unemployment rate is estimated to be around 50%. Uh, development, 38% of the city is either vacant land or abandoned structures. There's a dearth of consumer outlets, particularly corporate consumer outlets. There are no chain super supermarkets in the entire city. There are no department stores, no shopping malls. There's not a Walmart, Target, Costco, Sam's Club, Best Buy, Toys R Us, Lowe's, you can go down the line. I think there's, I can count three big box stores of any kind in the entire city. Um, public services are being cut left and right. The city is under a tremendous uh, 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 strain right now to cut its budget. It's been threatened with insolvency. It's been threatened with uh, takeover by an emergency manager, in which case all elected officials would be stripped of their powers. And Detroit has, over the years, lost much of its white population. You can see in the numbers, Detroit grew to be one of the largest cities in the country during the age of industrialism. At that time, it was predominantly white. It shrank in population as uh, industry declined and is now over 80% African American. So when we think about all the things are missing, well, one obvious demand people could be making is, how do we get those things back? How do we get back the jobs? How do we get back the, the union membership? How do we get back the contracts, the security, the benefits, the public employment, the public services? And it makes sense that people would be trying to reclaim what was lost. But history moves on. And so one of the things we're really focused on in Detroit, not just Grace and myself, but all of the community organizers were involved in, all of the grassroots movements, is recognizing that we need to make a paradigm shift at this moment in history, at this moment, at this time on the clock of the world, towards thinking about social justice in a new way. During the industrial age, we lived through the high period of economic growth, unionization, and the redistribution of surplus value. And Detroit was very, very iconic for its unions, for its factories, for being the motor city. And many people look upon those as the good old days. In fact, for, for some people, they really were the good old days. But we can also see that the American dream of a middle class standard of living, while it was creating great uh, uh, unprecedented levels of security and stability and comfort for some, particularly workers, who had never before achieved uh, uh, that level of living, was also built on racism, militarism, and consumerism, or what Martin Luther King called the giant triplets at the core of oppression in America. And so in this post-industrial age, how can we see Detroit as a site for new revolutionary possibilities, for a new vision of social justice, at a time when the surplus value is not being produced the way it once was, how do we see the deficits in Detroit as challenges and opportunities? And how do we look at Detroit as being at the core of a dying empire and seeing the death of empire as bringing forth liberatory possibilities? So what does it mean? What are these possibilities that we can think of today? Grace Boggs often talks about Detroit as having the place and space to begin anew. And so it's so exciting to see more and more geographers engaging with Detroit that there is a privileged position, even though obviously there's a lot of suffering and neglect and hardship in the city, that there's a privileged position to live on the margins of the global capitalist order. And we can begin to think of revolution not simply as the seizure of state power, as was very predominant in the 20th century, or the redistribution of the spoils of empire that have been produced but instead revolution as a new beginning, a challenge to reconstruct human relations from the ground up. To go beyond the stage of fighting for equal rights and citizenship within the system, to go beyond protesting what we were against, to go beyond pointing out the ways in which minorities have been oppressed, and to begin to move towards creating a participatory democracy when it's so clear that our current model of representative democracy has been corrupted and is failing. And that we develop forms of activism that can prefigure new models of community, education, and work. And obviously, I'm not going to try to go deeply into those other than to put that image out there. But I want to talk particularly about the idea of work, because Grace mentioned it in the video. And of course, Detroit is known so much for its history of labor organizing, 
But how do we move from the concept of labor organizing, as important as the stage of that was, in assuring dignity, in having collective bargaining rights, in giving voice to workers, to thinking about reimagining work, to moving from the era of Fordism and Taylorism and scientific management and large-scale production back towards reclaiming a sense of scale and a sense of humanity that goes along with craft uh, and, and industries, or not even industries, a work and production modeled on creativity? How do we move back from decommodifying uh, the earth, going back, from, going back to earth instead of thinking about land as a commodity? How do we move from consumerism to a sustainable model of work and production and distribution? And how do we, as grassroots communities in Detroit and as people all over the US and the world, challenge market dependence, return a sense of local self-reliance, and have an economy rooted in interdependence? How do we think about Detroit not as a motor city company town, but as a site of grassroots community building? And with that, I want to really leave you with a different symbol of Detroit. So I love Motown music. It's a great nickname. We all have t-shirts that say Motown on it. But we want to move from the symbol of 20th century Detroit being the factory, and of course there are so many abandoned factories now that are a symbol of the collapse of that industrial order, towards the new symbol of 21st century Detroit that is starting to catch on, not just in the city, but all around the country. Really, all people from all over the world are coming to Detroit. So people that once came to see Detroit and witnessed the marvels of technology and industrialization and mass production and to see the Ford River Rouge plant that once employed 100,000 people are now coming to Detroit to see urban gardens, right? And so just want to leave with a very quick tweet uh, from Naomi Klein who said, uh, quoting Grace Lee Bugs, the vacant lot represents the possibilities for cultural revolution, the possibilities for imagining a new way of living, imagining a new type of community, a new relationship to the earth, a new relationship uh, to each other, um, and a new sense of interconnectedness. Um, so that was a tweet uh, that Naomi Klein gave from Gracie Boggs, and on that note, I will end and move on. I think it is fair to say that his many publications have influenced the field of social justice and geography profoundly. Uh, they include The Right to the City, Social Justice and the Fight for Public Space, the People's, Property, the People's Property, Power Politics and the Public with Lynn Staley, and Justice, Power and the Political Landscape with Kenneth Ulwig. I am delighted that Don is with us here tonight. I know that he will be familiar to many of you in the audience and welcome him to the podium. Like uh, Cornell West and uh, Tavis Smiley, but not with any of their eloquence, I too am going, am going to take you on a tour against poverty. 2012 marks the 100th anniversary of the famous San Diego Industrial Workers of the World free speech fight. In early January 1912, the San Diego County Council passed an ordinance outlawing street speaking in a 49-block area of downtown, though with exceptions carved out specifically for the Salvation Army and other religious organizations. Working at the behest of prominent San Diegans, that is, representatives of regional capital, the council sought to put an end to racial oratory from the Socialists, the Single Tax League, and especially the industrial workers of the world. The IWW fought back, and by March 1912, the fight was fully engaged with Wobblies uh, and their allies militant in the refusal to either abide by the ban or with police move on orders that allowed the police to break up meetings anywhere in the city. Members of the powerful Merchants and Manufacturers Association led by sugar magnate John Speckles were equally militant, advocating full bore, even armed response against the free speech fighters. On March 4th, the San Diego Union added its voice advocating the hanging of those who defied the speaking ban. There were no hangings, but there was, there was significant violence. 
Emma Goldman was abused and her consort Ben Reitman was driven out of town into the desert, made to run the gauntlet, tarred and feathered, and left to find, out, find his own way back to the city or to die. Hundreds of militant workers and dozens of their supporters, working class and bourgeoisie alike, filled the prisons. Fearful that the unbridled violence of the merchants and manufacturers vigilantes was giving the state a bad name, California Governor Hiram Johnson eventually threatened to activate the military and begin arresting the vigilante leaders rather than the IWW. With that threat, the vigilantes backed down and the street speaking ban was repealed. The IWW's demands in San Diego were deceptively simple, but they implicated a complex and a depressing geography of injustice in and beyond the American West. They fought for one thing, the ability to exercise the First Amendment right to speak on the street, a right that most courts had hitherto simply not recognized. This was a demand that garnered considerable cross-class support and was thus tactically very smart, but it was also organizationally necessary. The IWW ideas and ideology were anathema to what Wobblies called the kept press or the capitalist press. Even more, publicity for IWW organizing efforts was effectively banned from all but the IWW's own radical papers. Street speaking was not an end in itself, but a means for getting the IWW's ideology into the ears of hoped for converts. It was a tool for organizing. It was a tool for organizing made necessary also by the geography of production the IWW sought to radically transform. A primary focus for IWW organizing in the American West, and to some degree back in the East, were migratory workers who, when, often, who, uh, when working, often lived in company-controlled labor camps. Between jobs, they returned to the city, living in rooming houses in hobo jungles and hanging out on the streets checking in with the highly exploitative labor sharks, that is the labor contractors, located in and around Skid Row. Under these conditions, control of the street corner implied potential control over regional labor and thus production networks. Taking and taking to the streets was a necessary and a strategic act. It was a means of remaking a system of production that was hyper-exploitative. It was a, me a way to create, as the IWW put it, a new world out of the shell of the old. The merchants and manufacturers understood, understood this very well. That's why their response was so violent. The governor understood this well too, which is why after threatening to activate the military, he worked even harder to develop a progressive regime of speech that would protect formal rights while assuring they never had much real effect. His goal was not to ban the IWW, but to take the sting out of them. Although it should be noted that the sting was actually taken out, whatever the progressives like Hiram Johnson intended, uh, through force when the IWW was outlawed during World War I. The road from San Diego in 1912 to the suppression of the IWW in 1917 nonetheless ran straight through Sacramento. And not only because the Progressive Era California Commission of Immigration and Housing, impaneled by Governor Johnson the same year as the San Diego fight, played such a crucial role in Washington-sponsored espionage against the Wobblies. It was also because the road through Sacramento was the highway along which the 1914 Kelly's Army thought it would march on its way to Washington to demand work with decent pay for the unemployed. Kelly's army started in San Francisco where it was met with much hostility as it mustered its forces in a series of encampments south of Market, marched through Oakland where it also met much hostility, and descended thousands strong on Sacramento where it camped near the State House demanding relief and provisions for their march. Tolerated in, at first, indeed, the encampment became something of a tourist attraction for radicals and for tourists alike. Uh, the sheriff soon deputized hundreds of what he called upstanding citizens who formed the core of a counter army of 800, including several fire companies that swooped into the encampment, spraying powerful hoses, arresting identifiable leaders, and routing the marchers. Kelly's army's occupation of prime space in California's capital had become intolerable to both capital and to the state. The self-same gubernatorial administration that had put a stop to the bloodshed and at least formally upheld the rights of militant workers two years earlier in San Diego now cheered on the sheriff from behind the scenes, as did much of the kept press. The reports in the New York Times of Kelly's army being routed, for example, are practically gleeful. <laughs> 
With its rout, Kelly's army dissipated, but the political and economic currents it symbolized continued to roil. In rural California, encampments of dissatisfied or striking workers were a regular part of the landscape throughout the latter half of the 1920s and into the 1930s, especially as ethnically Mexican agricultural workers grew militant in the last couple of years of the decade. Often forced into striking strikers' camps as they were shut out of company housing in the labor camps, militant workers found that taking and occupying space was vital to organizing resistance against and within the very spaces of injustice that defined their lives. They were met up and down the state with impressive violence, violence designed not only to break up their power, but also and especially to reassert control over the spaces that made their power possible power that by the mid-1930s seemed to portend a radical change in the long-standing structure of injustice that marked the California Valleys. As with the IWW a generation earlier, the demands of strikers were often deceptively simple, a small rise in wages or a demand that the government disarm the farmers, but they implicated a whole spatial system of production and reproduction, and as such could be little tolerated, not only by organized agribusiness, but also by the larger state apparatus. For everything else they were, the development of the Farm Security Administration labor camps in the latter half of the 1930s were as much a means to quell dissent to business as usual as they were a means to at least nominally protect the rights of workers in the fields. On the national front, the well-known Bonus March of 1932 also made clear the limits of tolerance for poor and working people's movements. When Hoover grew tired of the 15 to 20,000 veterans and their families who had descended on Washington to demand payment promised for 1945 be moved forward to meet immediate needs in 1932, he sent in the Army, the U.S. Army, which had not been used against the U.S. people since the Battle of Blair Mountain in 1921, an army commanded by Douglas MacArthur to clear out occupied buildings along Pennsylvania Avenue sending in tanks, using live ammunition, and volleying round after round of tear gas, MacArthur marched on to Anacostia, where the bonus marchers had established an integrated, orderly, carefully organized camp, a camp that authorities nonetheless claimed endangered health and safety, and set it on fire. By the time MacArthur's scorched earth policy had run its course, two veterans and two babies were dead. The bonus expeditionary force had been routed, and its leaders either bought off or sent into hiding. As with the IWW, taking space, by taking space, the bonus marchers were able to articulate demands that were quite simple, but which implicated a structure of inequality, a ubiquitous geography of injustice that extended well beyond those immediate demands, as was made plain in the very integration of the bonus encampment in the midst of hyper-segregated Washington. Poor and working people's taking and occupation of space, a necessary precondition to their exercise of power, is simply intolerable, especially if they seek to organize and govern, govern that space on their own, rather than on settled bourgeois society's terms. Nowhere has this been clearer in the last three decades than in the encampments of homeless people. This is true whether the encampment is overtly political, like the Community for Creative Nonviolence's Reaganville encampment in Lafayette Park across from the White House in the early 1980s, the Supreme Court's dismantling of which provided the legal pretext for clearing out the Occupy DC encampments earlier this winter. It's as important there as it is uh, is of less overtly political tent cities like the one on the banks of the American River in Sacramento that Oprah discovered in 2008. The Camden one cleared out by cops after being tolerated by city fathers for much of the winter in 2009. Or the St. Petersburg, Florida one that cops took box cutters to, destroying donated tents and illegally confiscating belongings in 2007. At St. Pete, Tenth City resident Brad Bradford accurately put it, every time we get leadership, they get a bus ticket out of town. Alternative organization, alternative modes of life, autonomy, all made possible by the occupation of space, even by the poorest, most marginalized among us, for whom housing markets 
and housing programs have little but disdain, must, it seems, be destroyed. And destroyed they are. That is the history of every autonomous encampment of homeless people there is, whether that destruction takes the form of outright annihilation, as with the innumerable raids on homeless encampments in Miami in the 1980s and 1990s, in which cops seemed to relish in lighting residents' belongings on fire, or chasing the campers from pillar to post through the scrub and wasteland of the river bottom, as in Sacramento, or calling in the architects and the philanthropists to create paternalistic, fenced, heavily policed, curfew-controlled homeless campgrounds, as in Ontario, California, or Pinellas County, Florida. The demands of homeless city residents are complex, especially in comparison to the IWW back in 1912. They might include access to decent physical and mental health care, to jobs, to a safe space over which they have some sovereignty, to shelter within which they have some autonomy, to decent nutrition, or to just being left alone to drink or smoke or get high with their friends. Pleasures that you and I more or less take for granted. But they implicate a startlingly simple geography, a geography in which in city after city there is just about no place where they can be at all. A city that simply has no room for them, certainly not on their own terms. Tent City, like IWW Street Corner speaking, like Kelly's Army's encampment, like the bonus camp, it seems, must be destroyed. Across the country, outright destruction of Tent City, police raids that include jailings, confiscations, and often destruction of homeless people's property, takes a common form. First, the health inspectors are sent in, then the city passes an emergency ordinance declaring the tent city a health hazard and often inventing new laws against camping in public. A deadline for homeless people clearing out is announced. In advance of the deadline, charities and city-employed social workers move in, may, um, offering a bus ticket, perhaps a temporary housing voucher, maybe a space in an overcrowded and dangerous shelter, sometimes even job counseling. Many tent city residents do not accept these, preferring the community and the comradeship they have developed, the new ways of living, over uncertain, temporary, and often the infantilizing ministrations of the social service network. The deadline comes, and homeless people, together with their supporters and advocates, brace for a raid and plan modes of resistance, usually passive. Nothing happens. The deadline passes. The supporters go home. The homeless people let down their guard. In the middle of the night, one, two, five, or seven days later, the police sweep in, accompanied not by tanks, as were used against the bonus marchers, but by dump trucks and even bulldozers, rousting homeless people from their tents, gathering up tents and other accoutrements of camping, arresting or merely moving on homeless people, destroying the physical manifestations of camping they have somewhat autonomously created, a form of community that, as reduced to bare life as it seems to be, nonetheless portends another world being possible, a world of mutuality more than competition, of solidarity more than the manic striving that defines most of our lives. The Occupy movement's demands, if it can be said to have any, are complex as those of any homeless tent city residents. And Occupy encampments, like their predecessors in Spain and Greece, implicated geography that is just as simple, if now more universalized. There is little or no space for us, not on our terms anyway, and not unless we take it. And that's what Occupy did in city after city. It took space. In taking space, it created a space for experiment, an experiment in living otherwise, in organizing relations with each other not subservient to the creation and circulation of capital. It created a space for experimenting with new, if sometimes highly localized, islands of justice in a wide sea of injustice. Occupy encampments with all their contradictions enforced by the class war we innocuously call neoliberalism based on a model of accumulation and wealth distribution with all its contradictions that makes all of us the existential equivalent of homeless tent city residents in our own homes and in our own cities. Little wonder then that the mode of assault on the Occupy movement has been exactly the same as it has been on tent cities. The pattern is the same in large part because the stakes are the same, if now on a larger scale. The lesson of history from the IWW 100 years ago to the present is one of the simultaneous necessity and the impossibility 
of taking and holding space if a more just geography and life is to be made. Taking and holding space is necessary because it provides not only the means by which it is possible to experiment with new forms of life, new modes of cooperation, new modes of solidarity within a geography that is manifestly opposed to all of these. Taking and holding space is impossible because doing so necessarily threatens vested interests, threatens those who profit from the current arrangement of things. Taking and holding space necessarily calls up the power and often the violence of both private interests and a state that must protect those self-same interests. State power and state violence is contradictory. As the IWW so clearly showed in San Diego 100 years ago and out of those those contradictions, the IWW helped pave the way for a liberal free speech regime commensurate with liberal capitalism and to some degree welfare capitalism too. Make no mistake, this was a huge advance and a primary legacy of the IWW, even as during World War I it was destroyed as an organization and its anarcho-syndicalism buried. The Occupy movement has resurrected some of that old anarcho-syndicalist spirit and in its attempts to reformulate it, to find ways to create a new world out of the shell of the old, has become just as intolerable to settled power as the IWW itself was. Cities, it seems, have no choice but to destroy the occupation, to eliminate the space of dissent. To the degree that Occupy can reclaim and hold again space, to the degree that can resist the move on regime that has marked policing for more than a century now, just as homeless people do every time their encampments are destroyed, then to that degree it has the opportunity to push even further the deceptively simple, the impossible yet necessary task the Wobblies set for themselves a hundred years ago. That is, the revolutionizing of the geography in which we might in which we must all live. Thank you. Our fifth speaker tonight is uh, also known to many in the room, Professor Ruth Wilson Gilmore, known to most of us as Ruthie, uh, is Professor of Earth and Environmental Sciences at City University of New York Graduate Center. Uh, her book, Golden Gulag, Prisons, Surplus, Crisis, and Opposition in Globalizing California, uh, was the winner of the ASA's uh, Romero First Book Award. And uh, she's working on three book projects with interesting titles. Life in Hell, or How Capitalism, Saving Capitalism from Capitalism Must Fire Our Political Imaginations. Um, big Things, Landscape, State, Form, and the Infrastructure of Feeling, uh, as well as a collection of essays on race, polity, and place. Ruthie. How is everyone? It's been a long day. I know a lot of people only just got here. Okay. Here we go. Um, thank you so much. Uh, Audrey for inviting me to join my distinguished colleagues and thank you all for coming out. This is a hard room to look at, <laughs> but I'll, I'll do my best. I'll do my best to have my eyes over here. All right, this talk is called Notes on Revolution from an Internationalist Abolitionist Perspective and this talk is for Clyde Adrian Woods. We're approaching the 20th anniversary of the Los Angeles uprising, one that Mike Davis dubbed, rightly, multicultural in the peopling of its manifest dismay. The immediate cause was the acquittal of four Los Angeles Police Department officers who beat the crap out of motorist, out of black motorist Rodney King, and whose deeds circulated the globe thanks to the surprise energetic filming of the incident by a nearby resident, a white working class man called George Holliday. The deeper cause was the result of a generation long counter revolution coupled with capital flight and both individual and social wage squeezes on the one hand and the ungloved uh, iron fist to deal with the dispossession and the displacements on the other. Were I to show some slides today, most would be pictures, 
photos of people rising up, of people on the move, of people locked up, of people locked out, of people organizing against their own abandonment. But at least one of the slides, where to show, show you the slides today, would be a um, picture that shows the decline in employment in Southern California and the cumulative effect of structural adjustment produced by capital flight in the sense of moving out of Southern California, but also of moving into machinery, wherever the machinery might be located, and the reconstitution of industrial labor sectors. The point, uh-oh. <laughs> the point is, as I have argued el elsewhere, the reconfiguration of labor markets mirrored the explosion of prison growth, not just numerically, but demographically, across a generation. Now, a generation is a long time, but as CLR James teaches us, a revolution takes place because people are so conservative. They wait, and wait, and wait, and try every mortal thing until they reach a stage where it is absolutely impossible to go on. And then they come out into the streets and clear up in a few years the disorder of centuries. That's from Modern Politics, 1960. Now the counter-revolution's aim was to obliterate radical organizing, especially black and other third world peoples in the US, along with radical white, anti-colonial, anti-capitalist individual individuals and groups. They, these organizations, all had long complicated histories of internationalism, whether as communists, pan-Africanists, parts of revolutionary cadres associated with the Mexican Revolution, and so forth. This political alienation, or counter-revolution, took many forms and expressions, including, for example, the 1988 general criminalization of young people of color and poor young white people in California under a law titled the Street Terrorism Prevention and Enforcement Act. Back to 1992. A moment before the uprising began, on April the 29th, 1992, several hundred people in South Central Los Angeles had just concluded a historic gang truce. In the breach opened by the organized abandonment that characterized post-Vietnam War era Los Angeles, street gangs reorganized territory and people in sometimes benign but also and by the late 1980s and early 90s, often murderous ways. But as the result of an extra-legal police murder of a former gangster, a one-day truce was established in order to allow the dead man's family from various city territories to attend his funeral. I've written about this day and its aftermath in a few places, and you can read about it in my book if you wish. But today, I want to emphasize another aspect of that truce. At the funeral, at the young man's funeral, the imam of a local independent mosque invited the gangsters to come to his neutral site to continue dialogue. The funeral had become a political protest, and that expression of antagonism toward the police produced an opening for the gangsters to explore stopping the work of being unbadged police deputies killing each other. In the course of seeking a language, to express what the truce could be, initially, a few of the gang members, who were also students in, the local, in one of the community colleges in LA, looked into texts that for them adequately expressed the sensibility of irreconcilable territorial and identitarian differences, because that's how they felt going into the truce, that they had irreconcilable territorial and identitarian differences. So in order to find a text, they read and used a number of United Nations Security Council resolutions written to conclude the Six Days War and then the 1973 war in the Mideast. But in the course of consolidating and expanding the truce, many people from organizations that had roots in radical struggle came to the table to talk politics with the gangsters. These organizations, uh, sometimes tiny, were composed of people who had not been murdered, who had not been driven into exile, or hounded underground 
by the U.S. counter-revolution. They might be dissembling, but they were still there. And new formations, suffering under the same weight of criminalization and constant hunting, influenced the development of political consciousness taking place at the truce table. Thus, the imam was joined by people who had been members of the Black Panther Party for Self-Defense, the Communist Labor Party, the Black Awareness Community Development Organization, founded by a black man who converted to Islam while in prison. But also, they met with people who were members of the Los Angeles Eight, a group of seven Palestinians and a Kenyan woman who was married to one of the Palestinians, who, um, who had been charged uh, under the McCarran-Walter Act as um, uh, providing uh, help and uh, uh, support to a terrorist organization. Now, they had been charged for being terrorists because they had possession of and had been distributing, not as paid distributors, but to people who were interested, the newspaper of an organization that's long been banned by the United States uh, called the Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine. And uh, so the Los Angeles Eight had been going through year after year after year of criminal court cases, sometimes in custody and sometimes not. But they brought the discussion of what their view of the Middle East was to the gangster's table. As a result, the template for the truce derived from the UN Security Council, while never actively disavowed as far as I know, was superseded by an internationalist sensibility concerning the dispossession uh, concerning dispossession, settler colonialism, and difference. From the imam, they learned that the prophet teaches that God created difference so that we might get to know one another, that difference underlies what should be, the social, rather than what is, racist ethnic exclusion. Thus, the infrastructure of feeling that made possible this peace was actually in the longer term, an internationalist political sensibility, the foundation of the black radical tradition as Cedric Robinson teaches it to us. In my view, this shaped the possibility for national gang convenings which came on the heels of this truce, and um, truces throughout the United States, and the deep decline in intranational warfare between and among the dispossessed. And if you want to measure this, measure it in the decline in homicide rates for example. Um, and it, made, it created the possibility for looking beyond, for looking beyond. So the gangs, having repurposed a document that seemed to give them the foundation for a certain kind of peace through political engagement with longtime activists, redefined what peace should be, not in a progress to liberalism, but in the movement to renovate and make critical already existing activities in order to remake the world where they live. What they did, what for me the infrastructure of feeling consists of, was to select and then reselect their ancestors to take Raymond Williams' idea of tradition down to the ground for a look at it. In so doing, they realized how their lives, while circumscribed by the territorial boundaries established through their warfare and policing, were not so local as one might have imagined. By circulating, for example, in and out of the prison system, in the prisons in California and rural California, that middle set of slides that Don showed, and also circulating between Southern California and the places in Texas and Louisiana where most of their parents or grandparents had migrated from, they developed a consciousness about territory, space, and boundaries that changed their entire sense of the political possibilities of the world in which they live. Um, so, in particular, in circulating through prisons, which became uh, steadily blacker during this time, they met more and more people from a number of different places and uh, sort of across the racial spectrum, uh, where millions in those places, in prisons, where millions and millions of modestly educated women and men, mostly of color, spend part or all of their lives locked in cages. The gangsters repurposed their purpose and in so doing enabled a renovation of the remnants of the organizations of which I spoke. So we have this dialectical process at work. Meanwhile, what? The Contract on America took a bipartisan project, prison expansion, 
and made it the explicit platform that conjoined racism and its partial undoing through law to a means through law to redo racism again. Newt Gingrich taught his acolytes, quote, you favor a political revolution. You want to replace the welfare state with an opportunity society. You favor workfare over welfare. You want to lock pr prisoners up, and you're actually prepared to give up some political pork barrel to build as many prisons as you need. Now remember, I said prison expansion was bipartisan. So Gingrich, the opportunist ever, seized this and made it part of the radical right of the Republican Party's agenda. While mass incarceration was already well underway in the 1980s, as child poverty increased and still increases, in the 1990s it took yet another leap, just a huge leap. In this century, mass incarceration and the longest wars in US history shape consciousness in many ways. But more, more, more than that, they expose people to group differentiated vulnerability to premature death, which is my definition of racism. The underlying and renovated organizing that the gang truth story is an example of, rather than the cause or heart of, continued to gain strength and direction over those same two decades with a concept, abolition, leading at an edge. For abolitionists, freedom remains unwon, not only for the descendants of African slaves, but for all dispossessed peoples. By organizing around mass incarceration and immigrant detention, we try to connect struggles waged against settler colonialism for the ability and struggles for the ability for all people to organize themselves to win equality, which is not the same as becoming homogenized into an undifferentiated liberal subject. Fast forward to the occupations in the USA. The word occupy is fraught and I wish to recognize both the problem with the word and the fact that historically taken back by, for example, Leonard Peltier was also called an occupation. Liberate is probably better, but it needs to be distinctively so, not as a new round of property expropriation, but rather something open for use, but not alienation. We might call it a commons. The idea of a gift rather than a mortgage comes to mind. The OWS's movements look to Tahrir Square and their, as their inspiration, but also they sit, as it were, on top of intensive and extensive organizing to end mass incarceration, to end the wars, to end criminalization as an all-purpose displacement of social problems from their true cause to effective scapegoating. Many of us have a, accepted invitations to speak at the occupations or liberations, and we are rather insistent that the activists embrace some particularity while they also insist on their non-institutional, non-leader character. The latter is not quite true, that they have no leaders, and the former, that they're non-institutional, is quite, quite worrying. For example, when the General Assembly in Wall Street here began to convene, people who travel the uprisings around the planet and the experiments in alter alternative self-governance that we are all learning more and more about, especially in geography, they noted that presence of people at Wall Street who had spent a lot of time in the fabled El Alto in Bel Bolivia, learning there how to lead by obeying. That makes them leaders in Wall Street even if they're not bosses. But I also worry that the refusal to make demands is an uncanny echo, a not repurposing of the anti-state state that similarly refuses the vision of well-being, of welfare, that is the ne plus, plus ultra of equality writ large. I worry as much as anybody does about how the revolutions in North Africa and West Asia will resist the blandishments of a neurotic culture, as George Kent brilliantly said of Richard Wright's adventures of Western culture. And certainly, the anti-state state form seems appealing because it seems, when not thought through, to be the antithesis of authoritarianism rather than the disguise through which growing US domestic authoritarianism launched well before either 9-11 or 8-1-1990 proceeds. The black radical tradition and the blues epistemology, the great contemporary expression of the black radical tradition, framed and argued by the late, great Clyde Adrian Woods, gives us the means and opportunity to think through the material conditions of now and the ideological possibilities and constraints that tend to make now not conducive or conducive to a better later through planning.
the 20th century was completely shaped by racism, both its implementation and the fight against it. And here I need to make an aside about the performance effect. Some of you think when I say racism, I'm talking about black people because I'm black. That's ridiculous. The 20th century was completely shaped by racism. I have been reading endlessly histories about um, the uh, Hitler's empire and, and that part of the, country, uh, the world between the wars. It was completely shaped by racism, not just partly. All right. In the 21st century, the modalities of apartheid remain central to the practices of urban and not urban, rural and not rural capitalism. Oh, this technology. Okay. All right. In the 21st century, the modalities of apartheid remain central to the practices of urban and not urban, rural and not rural capitalism. A blues geography, which is effectively what I have presented this evening, is a way to make a way. And if we plan to win, then we have to plan with anti-racism centrally on the anti-capitalist agenda. How to do, how to achieve, how to renew. Big things. Thank you. Thank you, Ruthie. Thank you especially for that. Hello. I want to congratulate Don on what was a, a skillful and learned paper, and especially for bringing to our attention the mighty accomplishments of the first international of which the IWW was one. I would only say this. There is a bigger idea that came out of the first international, the early communist movement the early socialist movement, and the brothers and sisters of the industrial workers of the world. And that is the idea of one big union of all workers, intellectual workers such as yourselves, physical workers, all workers. And that the secondary to that, and this came out during the occupation in Oakland, the idea of a general strike this is not something that can be done overnight, but if geographers organize, if others organize, it can happen. And I thank you, Don, for allowing me to think of that idea. I'll just, stop. I'll just move um, across the room from mic to mic. Hi. Um, thank you all, that was really amazing. Sorry, I'm going to ask Don a question again. Sorry, <laughs> the rest of you. Um, I think you make a really great argument about the role of space and autonomous spaces in the right to the city and et cetera. But I don't know, it made me wonder when you brought up Occupy because, well, and I guess to put my context out there, I'm from Montreal. And so what happened, and I worked with in some context with people who were organizing at Occupy. And what happened is this sort of um, ultimate desire to, to keep this autonomous space that they had created led to things like calling police on homeless people who are in encampments or like overly extra radical people um, working very closely with police to maintain this autonomous space for them to continue this movement. So I'm wondering if you could speak to a potential danger in romanticizing physical spaces in this process? Take everything that I said only in relationship to what Fran and Scott said and Grace, right? That's, that's the answer that will help guard against the romanticism that's, that you, I think, rightly identify at the heart of what I was saying. Uh, so, so Fran's point about, um, about moving on to the next phase is a crucial one, right? Grace's point about uh, imagining uh, what happens next, it's the same argument that Ruthie is making is, uh, and planning for it is absolutely crucial as well. And these are things that I did not cover at all. So only listen to what I said in relationship to, to these. Can I, I, actually, I want to ask uh, each of the panelists if they'd like to make it, just a quick response mm -hmm. um, to yeah, that. Yeah, I, um, I would like to make a, a quick response, and, it, and it's this. Um, the, the way that people try to secure space 
ordinarily just mimics and reproduces capitalist space. The people imagine this is for my exclusive use rather than this is for my use. And we definitely see the scandalous behavior toward um, homeless people through in many, many of the occupation sites around the United States. By contrast, in Los Angeles, for example, homeless people in Los LA Skid Row have been organizing themselves for a very long time. And it is one of the key experiments of the Los Angeles Police Department, whether they can wipe that out. And there's a book, people who edited it are sitting right under my nose, called Freedom Now, that you all should get from Amazon, that is a fantastic book about what's been going on um, in LA Skid Row uh, politically uh, over the last, I don't know, while. <laughs> I think Occupy uh, and its resonance you know, across the country and then across the globe, uh, although Occupy itself was a reflection of uh, protests that had started earlier in Spain and in uh, Egypt and in T Tunisia. But I think this worldwide uh, series of uprisings is a big movement. It's already a big movement and it's going to last for a while. But I think in observing this movement, we have to take account of the fact that movements are by their very nature big, amorphous, complicated, different kinds of groups with different issues, with different ideological principles, with different attitudes toward violence, for example, or different attitudes toward space indeed, movements are tangled and difficult. And there will be, there'll be arguments, there'll be factional fights, the movement will stall. Everybody will say, well, I guess it's over, but it won't be over. It'll well up again. I mean, that's the nature of this animal, which is, it's, it, it's, it's not a bureaucratic operation. It's not created by a state. It's created by the reactions and the imagination and the energy of people responding to a constellation of changes that they cannot tolerate. And that's going to be kind of disorganized. But I think we have to live with it because it's the only thing we have to save us from planetary destruction and from capitalist destruction. Scott, you have a final word. Sure. Uh, yeah, I, I want to pick up where Ruthie left off because uh, I know LA very well too, um, in addition to Detroit. In LA, space has been so privatized, the commons has been taken away, uh, even Skid Row now is being gentrified. LA had this very thriving urban garden, community garden that was taken uh, back by uh, developers with the aid of the city. Um, and Detroit has so much space that's been abandoned by capital, right? And that Detroit has so much space to become what Harvey calls the space of hope, spaces of hope, right? And so we need to see that as an opportunity. So Detroit should not be seen as sort of the exception to what's going on in the rest of the country. It's paradigmatic, it's collapsed as paradigmatic of the racism and dislocation and violence inherent in capitalism, but it also can become paradigmatic of a new sp space of hope that we're trying to create um, all over the place. Um, the last thing I just wanted to mention was, you know, I, I didn't have enough time to talk about it. I didn't have enough time to say as much about how much uh, the, what's happening, the movement in Detroit today, is rooted in the blues epistemology, in the black community organizing tradition um, uh, as well. And so when we think about the civil rights movement, it wasn't just a movement for public accommodations and voting rights. It was building a new model of a beloved community out of oppression and out of struggle. It was building models of conflict re resolution and restorative justice that are so important now when we see uh, heightened levels of state violence and repression and imprisonment. It was building models of education through the freedom schooling movement. Even through the uh, Black Panther Party and through the Black Power Movement, it was creating models of community health when these things weren't being provided by the state or when the state was providing uh, 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 discriminatory or, or in some cases even you know, uh, 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 detrimental models of health and education uh, for the black community and other people of color. So I just wanted to make sure to make that point. Thank you. I, I think there's no question that geography, at least tonight, goes beyond symbolism. <laughs> um, David Harvey, by the way, very much wanted to be here, and I think if he were, he'd be very happy to have heard the speakers tonight. But he is 
uh, very far out of the country, but sent his best wishes. Uh, thank you to all of the speakers. Thank you to all of the audience, especially those who have stayed and we're running a few minutes over. Uh, this has really been the dream panel come true. Thank you. <laughs> thank you.